The deathless phalanxes of the Necrons arise for a new edition once more. Let's see how the crackling beams of the Flayers and Reapers are going to be put to work in 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Necrons, and with 40k's favourite robot Xenos skeletons getting new rules shown off, I thought it was worth stopping off for a review of Necron Warriors with their shiny new datasheet in 10th. Within the Necron's army, the Warriors are very much the lower end of the Necron hierarchy, perhaps getting the raw deal out of the biotransference, having their flesh swapped for metal, but arguably not particularly high quality living metal, devolving the lower tiers of Necron society into little more than Solus Automata, silently and creepily following their overlord's commands. Even the standard foot trooper of the Necron race is a fairly formidable prospect to other armies though, they're armed with crackling gauss weapons that dissolve the foe at a molecular level, perhaps most effective against infantry, but they'll eat into even the thickest of armour, and given time will wear down even battle tanks with a focused barrage. They're also particularly well known for getting themselves back together after they get shot, living metal pulling themselves and standing the warriors back up to fight once more, particularly if there's some bloke with a mysterious glowing orb to encourage them on their way. Currently Necron Warriors are sold in this kit from Games Workshop, £30, €40 Euros and $50, that netting you 10 Necron Warriors plus 3 Scarab Swarms thrown in as well. I feel like they're maybe not too bad for a fairly hoardy faction troops choice. Necron Warriors are maybe a few more points in game than other lighter hordes that you might find in 40k. Plus getting an extra unit in the Scarab Swarms thrown in is pretty good fun. If you are looking to pick up Necron Warriors, I'd certainly keep your eye out for a recruit starter set from 40k 9th edition. They're going to be going away pretty shortly from the Games Workshop web store for 10th, but there's likely to be a lot of Warriors on eBay that you might be able to pick up a bit cheaper, and plenty of local gaming stores are likely to continue to stock that starter set going into the future. The models themselves I think are nice enough, fairly basic as they're your standard Horde troops choice, maybe not a whole load of variation between your standard robot skeleton with a gun. You do get a few fun choices though, including a choice of heads, whether you want some more net intact Necrons that have survived the Aeons, or ones that have taken a bit of battle damage along the way and you get the choice of two different weapons in the Gauss Flayer and the Double Barreled Gauss Reaper. As always, if you're looking to pick up this kit otherwise from Games Workshop, you can often get them at friendly local gaming stores. If you're going to order them in online, Element Games has them in the UK for 15% off, £25.50 at time of recording, and Noble Knight Games has them in the USA for $46. Can save a little bit, and both of those stores are linked in the video description. There are affiliate links that help support the channel, as well as save people a bit of money compared with buying from GW. Let's get on to their rules though, and here we have the data sheet for the Necron Warriors in 10th edition, a new reinterpretation of their stats compared with previously, certainly keeping a similar sort of feel to them, though there are a few big changes that I think will affect the way that they play. As with all of GW's previews so far, we still don't know the points costs for the Necron Warriors so far, and between that and not knowing the rest of the Necron Codex, we can't really say how strong they're going to be, but we can get a bit of a better idea as to how they're going to work. You'd be able to field up to 6 squads of them in 10th edition as their battle line units. Given that you can normally take Necron Warriors up to 20 man squads, should mean that you can field a very credible Silver Tide army if you really wanted to. Their 5 inch movement is admittedly a little bit on the slow side, a touch slower than most other infantry in Warhammer 40k, particularly as their effective firing range is always going to be 12 inches. At 24 inches, even if you have the flares, they're not going to be particularly exciting. Gas Reapers did lose the Assault keyword in this update, which means that they'll be limited to a 17 inch threat range now, at least outside of any other things that might be able to give them boosts like characters. A bit of a surprise on their data sheet for 10th edition is that they're only Leadership 7 plus, honestly that's surprisingly bad for a unit that's historically usually had a Leadership of 10, it seems that without commanding presence the slow wittedness of the Warriors might be working against them there. If you don't have a leader in the unit, that'd be a 42% chance to fail Battle Shock, which is going to make them pretty unreliable. Though from apparently the core way that leaders work, if you get joined by a leader unit that has a better leadership, then you'll be able to use the leader's one instead. I'd guess they'd probably have a 6+, plus, might even be a 5+, plus if Necrons get extra lucky. Should be able to mitigate that, and there's another draw to have a leader in the unit. Finally, for their core base stats, they're also Objective Control 2, as you'd expect for things that were troops in 9th. Given that they're quite numerous, and they can regenerate in quite a big way when they got shot down, they do seem like a pretty decent unit for holding objectives with. Talking of toughness and regeneration, Necron Warriors are toughness 4 and have a 4 plus save, the same as they had in 40k 9th edition. It's okay, but maybe not super exciting. Getting the benefit of cover if they can will be quite a big deal to them, going up to a 3 plus save, 
plus anything that gives them invul saves if the Chronomancer will still wind up doing that, again could be particularly nice. I feel like large squads of these are still going to be very tempting, but I bear in mind that blast weapons are going to bite a bit harder in 10th. If you had a unit full of 20 warriors and you get targeted by blast weapons, each one will be getting an extra 4 shots against you, which is really quite a big deal. Effectively that's over double damage for a d6 shot blast gun. I feel like that's a weapon class that Necron Warriors aren't going to enjoy, even worse than currently. As we talked about recently on the channel, the Necron reanimation protocols are really quite a big deal for them, and I feel like Warriors have maybe had a bit of a side grade on this. They've still got a very powerful version of it, but it does mean that they'll have to survive until the following turn for them to be able to use it at all, as they no longer just regenerate their models immediately after a unit attacks them. Particularly with the Warriors having such a powerful reanimation protocols, it does mean that the opponent's really incentivized to try and gun them down a full unit at a time, really focus fire and wipe the unit if they possibly can, though I feel like that might encourage you to take big squads despite blast risks, as then your opponent hopefully won't be able to wipe out the entire unit, and then you get a fair few back. The Necron reanimation protocols triggers at the end of the command phase, so I guess that will be after Battleshock as well. I believe it is the actual end of the command phase, and not just the command sub phase, as we've seen from the 10th edition rules leaks, so I guess you reanimate after Battleshock happens. The new rules are powerful though, Necron Warriors get D6 models back normally, or D3 plus 3 models on objectives. That really is a lot of Necrons returning to the board, if they're somewhere around 10 or 11 points again, that's likely over 50 points worth of models restored each time a unit uses this ability. Every time this actually goes off, it's going to be a massive swing in your favour. Again, I think it's going to be a big swing as to whether or not your opponent can wipe units though, and it feels like it's probably a side grade at best from the 9th edition version, if not a downgrade, seeing as the Warriors were quite so powerful with that rule, reliably standing back up on a 5+, plus just after each enemy unit shoots. I guess maybe something like a 10-man Warrior squad could be interesting enough for a home field objective, perhaps. It's almost always going to be not worth it in terms of the damage game for your opponent to shoot chip anti-infantry guns at them. And usually if you've got a low value infantry unit hiding in your own deployment zone, your opponent can't really afford to focus fire. In general I feel like they'd be very safe with holding your home field objective, though I suppose they would have that chance of taking battle shock if the opponent hits them too hard. That would probably be the biggest risk with them losing the objective, as opposed to gradually getting ground down. Besides toughness, when they attack the Necron Warriors, hit with your Grouse Flares and your Gauss Reapers. One change in 10th edition is that it looks like they hit on a 4 plus at base now, but at least in the Awakened Legion rules, they can get a 3 plus to hit really quite easily, just by having a Necron leader unit in the same squad as them. Maybe just another encouragement to have leaders in the units besides the actual leadership characteristic as well. Going from a 4 plus to a 3 plus is really quite a big deal. Ballistic skill 4 plus as well can be very susceptible to modifiers to hit as well if your opponent has those. Otherwise for damage they do little to nothing in close combat, or an attack at strength 4, AP 0, but the new profiles for their gas weapons are pretty interesting. Both the gas weapons have gained lethal hits, so that means 6s to hit auto wound the enemy, should be good for punching up against slightly tougher things than they normally want to fight. And now between the two you're basically choosing between a gas flare that gets a much weaker damage profile but at least can do something at 24 inches, or a Gauss Reaper that only has a 12 inch threat range, but gets a fairly decently better damage profile at strength 5 and AP minus 1. Compared with the old profiles, both of these have lost 1 pip of AP, I guess they'll swap that out for those lethal hits, which admittedly are pretty useful for small arms, and the Gauss Reaper has taken one nerf relative to the flare, in that it lost the assault keyword, so you can't advance and fire it anymore. For a gun that only had 12 inch range, that was often a pretty decent idea, if it could get more of the squad into range. I wouldn't be enormously surprised though if maybe one of the Necron support characters might be able to allow you to do that and give your unit the assault keyword. I guess we'll wait and see on that front. In its absence though, that probably narrows the gap just a tiny bit between the Flayer and Reaper. Just for interest, here's the damage breakdown between the Gauss Flayer and Gauss Reaper for 10 Necron Warriors firing. Here we've got the Gauss Flayer firing at 24 inches for 10 of them. Then the flare at 12 inches, which is obviously just twice as good as you get twice as many shots. And then the reaper at 12 inches, which is unexpectedly better in every single category. But that's only because it doesn't get the option for the weak fire at to 24 inches. In general, I wouldn't consider their damage output unbuffed on their own to be particularly impressive. For 10 warriors without buffs, I'd still say that the gauss reapers are mainly just merely okay. Necron Warriors probably aren't going to be the unit that's your primary big hitting damage dealers though I suppose. In general the Reapers are just a lot more general purpose than the Flayers. The Flayers are only really all that effective against light infantry. Even if you get an entire squad of them rapid firing into space marines you still only kill one of them. Though if you're targeting a horde like Termagants or something, you're not really losing out too much by taking the Flayers over the Reapers. 
against anything with just a little bit of toughness though, things that are toughness for with a reasonable armor save. The Gauss Reaper will often be about twice as good as the Gauss Flare in terms of damage output between the strength and the AP. They over double out the flares against Terminators for example. I think based on this initial impression I'd still be far more tempted to take Reapers over flares right now. There will definitely be times where they just don't get range or not all of them do. But I feel like the damage output of the shots out to 24 inches just often aren't going to be particularly meaningful. So in my mind I'd rather have a squad that actually has a proper bite to it once they actually get in close. I guess the flares could be nice enough though if you just want a little bit of chip damage from a home objective camping unit that otherwise isn't going to be doing so much. And admittedly, if there is a points disparity between these two guns now, then that might change things a bit. Then my guess is that as per now, they'll probably be costed the same. Otherwise, for things off the datasheet, we don't know the full Necrons rules, but Games Workshop did give us a bit of a teaser, plus we know plenty of the core rules from the book, like the new core stratagems. GW has teased the Necron Command Protocols rule. This one's the one that gives you a plus one to hit with your Necron characters attached to a unit, and that's if you're using their launch detachments, the Awakened Dynasty, but there's going to be other options when the Necron Codex comes out, not so very long after that. My guess is that a fair few of the Necron Elites will probably be hitting on a better number than a 4 plus most of the time, so this is going to be extra meaningful for Warriors perhaps. I feel like between the extra buff to hit and the leadership buff that they're going to get, Necrons are almost certainly going to want to have a leader in the unit, for any big battle line damage dealing squads. The leaders will add their own abilities and command things to the unit as well, plus whatever damage profile they have. It does mean that they should be adding a decent amount. I bear in mind that the plus one to hit won't affect the lethal hit chance, so it might not be as meaningful as it sounds against very tough targets, but still an extra third more hits on the enemy is hardly something that's going to be bad for them. It is going to be interesting to see what the Necron Warriors can do with the different buffs available to them, there's a lot of units that work quite well with them at the moment, things like Lords, Overlords, the Royal Warden and Cryptex, as well as things like the rules for the Reanimator and Resurrection Orb. For things like transports and vehicles, I feel like the Ghost Arc is going to be pretty interesting with the Gauss Reaper Warriors. That could be a very easy way to get them in range now. The 10th edition transport rules allow them to disembark after the transport has moved, so that can potentially zoom up into the midfield, jump them out on an objective and allow them to fry something within 12 inch range. That definitely sounds like it's got potential for a relatively tough, short-ranged and slow unit. I think the Necron Warriors are one of the more interesting ones with transports normally. I really like the previewed rule of that Monolith's Eternity Gate as well. Monoliths would certainly be a much bigger investment that you wouldn't just buy them for Warriors, but it will give you an interesting option on the board. You could push the Monolith up a bit and teleport the Necron Warriors next to it, and then unleash a whole load of Gauss Reapers once more. And I do like the way that you could use it as a bit of tactical insurance for the unit. If they get locked in combat, you could potentially have them teleport to the monolith without counting as falling back and still fire off all their guns. And you could get even more value out of it if the unit was battle shocked when they were doing so, as if you can avoid battle shock, you might be able to avoid taking those desperate escape casualties. Otherwise, we've seen a few stratagems, both from the core book and one of the Necron ones. I think Overwatch could be interesting enough with auto-wounding Gauss Reapers. It means that any sixes to hit at Overwatch will auto-wound, so sort of focuses on the most valuable bit of their shots. Kills around three Termagants or Light Infantry, or maybe puts one or two wounds on things with a 3 plus save. Could be interesting enough if you fire that in the movement phase, if your opponent's got something that's very badly injured. There's a 1 command point 1 for the Protocol of the Hungry Void, a plus 1 strength and an extra AP in melee if there's characters nearby. Might turn a fairly tame threat into something that's somewhat scary, again if you just desperately need a tiny bit more damage to end something before it kills you. Insane Bravery I think could be pretty useful for Battleshock, that can cancel it for 1 CP. Not having a unit Battleshock on an objective seems like a great idea, particularly if you're just about to put down an extra D3 plus 3 models there. And I feel like there could be an interesting one for the go to ground stratagem as well, that one gives them the benefit of cover for a 3 plus save against range and a 6 plus invo as well, both of which could be relevant if the enemy targets them with high AP things. They do feel like a unit that the more durability things that you can stack on them, the more you'll be rewarded in the squad surviving and reanimating a bit. Overall I feel like Necron Warriors are looking pretty interesting into 10th edition. They are a unit that's got a decent amount of support units in the codex, so it'll be interesting to see what's going to be best for them this time round. Being cheapish objective holders does seem like a pretty reasonable role for them. I feel like your opponent would rarely want to waste shots at them, even to try and force battle shock. If you just pass it, then they've just kind of wasted their shooting as you just reanimate most of the destroyed models. And if you fail it, you could potentially just cancel that for 1 CP, but that will be a bit of a drag. Usually being available in 20 model units, characters seem almost auto include for them, for the plus 1 to hit, and the better leadership. 
maybe have them with any big 20 model units, I feel like Ghost Arts to deliver smaller ones could also be interesting. When they're on the board, I feel like the game is to get the most reanimation out of them, probably. Big tough units to survive enemy fire, maybe hiding part of the squad behind terrain, so that hopefully your opponent shoots you out of line of sight, and then you get to regenerate. And ideally stay on the objectives for the D3 plus 3 models, as opposed to the more random D6. But we're fun to see how they weigh up against the competition, and more tools will probably give them some competition for battle line troops, or flayed ones for a more melee alternative. Should be fun to see how they stack up in 10th. In any case, let me know what you make of 40k's favourite Gauss robots down in the comments below. With the previewed rules and the changes to reanimation protocols, could you see them being a staple of Necron armies at the right points cost, or do you feel like they're destined to be on the shelf in favour of other units? If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, but I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you're interested in helping support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.